I appreciate that um, a Brit talking about European disintegration seems a bit um, kind of, well, self-fulfilling, but um, let's pull this up. Um, many of you, um, well, some of you have asked me what I think will happen on the 23rd of June. Um, in three weeks' time, we will know whether or not Britain has decided to stay or to remain or to leave the European Union. Um, many of you will have wondered about this, um, and I cannot stress to you how uncertain the result is. If you think surely the British cannot be silly enough or do something like leave the European Union, yes, we can. We really can leave the European Union. And I am so uncertain of the result, um, it, my opinion changes by the day based on the opinion polls, based on my own sense of what's going on, on online, that I will make a decision now, in the way that I have for several weeks, with a coin. Heads, Britain stays in. Tails, Britain leaves. Britain's leaving. Okay? <laughs> That's how close this, elect this result could be. We don't know um, what, um, we can't rely on the opinion polls. They say about, you know, they say, they still say that the Remain camp still is in the lead, but this is only the third time that the United Kingdom has had a nationwide referendum. The first was in 1975 over membership of the European Economic Community, and the second was in 2011 on electoral reform. So we have no basis on which, no, no information on which to base um, any, ex, any kind of polling data in terms of its reliability. That's why there will be no exit poll um, for, um, for the referendum. So at 10 o'clock when the polls close, um, there will not be on the BBC or whoever um, suddenly a flash of kind of this is our big exit poll based on what the pollsters think um, from today because the pollsters have said they're not going to do that. They don't have enough data on which to base an exit poll. So we won't know until about four o'clock in the morning what's going to happen. So the possibility of Britain leaving is extremely high. And I'm going to face, focus more today on a Brexit um, than a Grexit, um, partly because that's consumed my life for the last few months. Um, when I come to write this up, I'll, I'll think more about the, um, the Greek situation in the, all this. But what I'm going to talk about briefly today is the issue of solidarity, first of all, in the European question within the United Kingdom. What exactly is Britain having a referendum on right now? Is it about Britain's solidarity with the rest of the European Union, about does it want to be with the rest of the EU or does it want to leave? Is it about that or is it actually about domestic politics? and solidarity within the United Kingdom. Then I will turn to the issue of solidarity in how the European Union responds to a British exit. There is the issue, which I won't have time to go into today, about solidarity in a Remain vote, a Bremain vote, as we call it. Um, I think it's more interesting to consider the implications for the EU's solidarity in the face of a British exit. And then, briefly, I will consider issues of disintegration, integration, muddling through, and then finally the issue of rebuilding trust. Whatever happens on the 23rd of June, there is the issue of what relationship the United Kingdom will have with the rest of the European Union and vice versa. Will the EU and the UK find a way of continuing to build, of continuing to develop a relationship what, which might not be quite as um, kind of as solid or kind of as reliable or, or, or as about solidarity as we might like, but um, which does provide some positive um, um, side um, on which to kind of um, look at things. So let's start with Britain's European question. The Prime Minister David Cameron, um, when he set out his intention to hold a referendum um, if he was re-elected with a majority government in 2015, um, he said basically that it was time to answer the European question in British politics. But it's never clear what that European question is. Some will assume it's about, as the cartoon shows, to be or not to be in Europe. Does Britain want to be in Europe or does it want to be apart from Europe? But it's not really that. Um, when you ask people what this referendum means for them, if you ask your average man or woman in the street, if you ask a diplomat, a government civil servant, different ministers, different aspects of the Leave campaign or the Remain campaign, they will give you a whole range of issues, many of which can be connected to the EU, but many of which are also about domestic British politics. First of all, we have to reflect on history. Britain has long been 
what Stephen George, the author from um, a Sheffield University professor, called an awkward partner. First, note he uses an, he uses the indefinite article. He does not describe Britain as the awkward partner. We all know that lots of, well, every member state is at some point a pain in the ass to the European Union. Um, you only have to think that the European Union has, the closest the EU in its history ever came to a complete collapse was the empty chair crisis brought about by General de Gaulle. Um, so not necessarily even the UK has taken the EU that close. Nevertheless, Britain has often been the country that says no. That said, again, one of the tactics that British diplomats were taught over the years was, you're the one everyone's going to rely on to say no because they all want to hide behind your no. They all want to say yes but not mean it. So there's an aspect to this in terms of Britain has been a more honest, open um, European um, in terms of how, how willing it has been to engage with the European Union. Nevertheless, Britain's relations have often been awkward. I don't want to deny that. The most awkward period um, has arguably been in the last few years with David Cameron seeking a renegotiation um, and, a, and essentially another um, version of another opt-out for the United Kingdom. So is it about history? Are the British people here saying, look, we've been like this for too long, let's get out? Is it about sovereignty? In the United Kingdom, you'll hear people talk about taking back control, um, that the idea of pooling sovereignty with the rest of the EU, showing solidarity with our EU partners in the face of ongoing problems around the world, that doesn't just, that really doesn't kind of um, get anywhere with some people in the UK. But then the term sovereignty in the UK has numerous meanings. It can mean parliamentary sovereignty, it can mean economic sovereignty, it can mean kind of popular sovereignty, it can mean uh, kind of legal sovereignty. Lots of people have different definitions of what sovereignty means. Even within, within the UK, the idea of sovereignty is contested. Is it about democracy? Um, is this about the British people being asked um, and deserving the right to be asked um, whether or not they should be um, in the European Union? But then the question beg begs the question, why not have a referendum on lots of other issues? Is this really about consulting the British people? Or is it about David Cameron getting out of a tight spot with the, within the Conservative Party? Is it about immigration and Schengen? Um, immigration has certainly become the defining issue in the Leave campaign. Um, but as the Remain camp point out quite regularly, um, the immigration policy that the Leave, lead Leave campaigners such as Boris Johnson and so forth seek is one that would essentially allow large numbers of people to continue to come to the UK from all around the world and not just from within the European Union. Schengen comes into this, there's a sense that um, the EU is dysfunctional when it comes to immigration, that the UK somehow is also suffering from the collapse of Schengen, even though, as we all know, Britain is not actually in Schengen. But nevertheless, there's that sense that Britain is being dragged into the Schengen problems. Is about economics and trade. Again, um, the United Kingdom has always had a very transactional relationship. Um, for the Remain campaign, economics has become the key message that they are putting out to the British people. So the Leave campaign is going on immigration, a bit of a gut issue. Um, the Remain campaign is going on economics. Would you be worse off in terms of your income, in terms of your job security and so forth, in terms of our overall GDP if the UK left, or would you um, actually be better off in terms of leaving? Do you believe in the long run that Britain is tying itself, as one prominent Eurosceptic put it, in joining the European Union, Britain shackled itself to a corpse, that the EU is declining, Europe is a declining center of world power and world economics, and that actually this isn't the future. Um, Therefore, is it about value for money? So it's not about solidarity with the rest of the EU, it's about getting what we can out of this. Even the Remain camp, that's the main message that's coming out. Is it about security and peace? The Prime Minister has spoken quite clearly about this. Um, he received a lot of ridicule when he argued that a British exit could essentially lead to instability in Europe, which a lot of people took to mean war. Um, if it is such a kind of high politics issue of war and peace, of security and stability for the United Kingdom and the European Union, then why exactly has he called a referendum on it? If it's such an important issue, why has he bothered to go down this route? That's why a lot of people in the UK kind of see through this. Nevertheless, 
Um, a lot of people in the United Kingdom look at the situation in Ukraine, connect the issue with regard to migration and terrorist attacks in Paris and so forth with potential threats to the United Kingdom from remaining within the European Union. So again, this sense that actually there's no solidarity in staying within the European Union, we'd be better off on our own. Is it about international relations? The President of the United States has been very clear. This is not just about um, UK um, security, this is about the, um, the solidarity of the Western world and the transatlantic relationship of the UK's place within a European Union and a transatlantic relationship that is the cornerstone of the international institutions the United States has led in building since 1945. To some people in the United Kingdom that matters, to others President Obama should have just have kind of been told to get lost, it was none of his business. Is it about globalization? To some extent, as I said earlier, the EU is seen as declining, the past, it's about emerging markets and Britain returning to some kind of imperial kind of trading relationship with large areas of the rest of the world. And remember, the UK, um, one of the most interesting things about the, um, the referendum debate is the large number of ethnic minority um, community people who will, as a majority, vote for the, for the UK to remain in, but there's still a large number who want to vote to leave because the EU is not their hinterland. If you're Indian or of Pakistani or Australian descent, the EU is not what, where you kind of come from in terms of your history, and they would like to see relations built with those emerging markets or other parts of the world. Is it about constitutional issues and unity? There are the tensions over Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, that they may vote differently from other parts of the United Kingdom. So this is a question about Britain's unity and solidarity in terms of England especially. Large areas of England will almost certainly vote to leave, whereas large areas of Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland will probably vote to remain. One of the most clearly defined aspects of English nationalism is Euroscepticism. But why? What is it about Euroscepticism that appeals to English nationalism? Well, there's something going back to the issue that England doesn't have its own parliament, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland get their own way, and then there's London. If you've ever been to London, and you've only been to London, please don't ever say you've been to the UK. You've been to an undiscovered country within the United Kingdom. London is now down to about 35 to 40% white British. Um, it is an international global city that is, our, that is the most powerful, most important part of the United Kingdom, its largest part. Economically, it, it, it's worth more to the United Kingdom than Germany is to the European Union. It dominates the UK's politics, economics, and so forth, but it's not a very English or British place. So there's a bit of a tension here because this is also the city that runs the United Kingdom. So there's a tension here within the UK in terms of, well, where is London going off to? People talk about Scotland as being the, slight, the most distinct part of the UK. It's not. It's the capital city. Is it about public elite relations? Um, this referendum is turning into a chance to give the government a kicking. Um, it's turned into a test of how faithful or how much faith British people have in institutions such as the Bank of England, um, the IMF, the Institute for Fiscal Studies, pretty much the entire academic community, think tank community, pretty much the entire elite of Britain is saying don't leave the European Union. But there is a great degree of skepticism here amongst the British public about this elite that tends to be, again, focused in London, um, therefore very international. Um, what's it, you know, of course they'd say that it's in their interest, not necessarily in the interest of your average man somewhere else in the UK. Is it about party politics? This referendum has become a battleground for the leadership of the Conservative Party. People will vote on the 23rd of June as to whether or not they want David Cameron and his side of the Conservative Party to continue, in govern continue governing after the 23rd of June, or they want another side led by Boris Johnson and Michael Gove to take over the leadership. It's a bit of a sad state that we've got into this position where party politics and the Conservative Party politics has become the issue, um, but nevertheless, this was seen to be coming for quite a long time. It's also an issue in terms of generations and class and educational background. The older generation is overwhelmingly Eurosceptic, yet they were the generation who in 1975 voted overwhelmingly in favour of staying in the European Economic Community. So they've grown up and they've grown very Eurosceptic. The young tend to be more optimistic, much more um, committed to European solidarity. You might say, um, if you're looking at this from an older generation, they're naive, they've not grown up yet. 
Or you could also say that the older generation has been subjected to 40 years of non-stop criticism of the European Union and there's never been a positive message put across in the UK about the EU because of the UK's political tensions over admitting um, its commitment to the European integration. And it's also a matter of class um, and social background. Um, if you come from a working class background, if you only have an education to the age of 16, you are highly likely to vote leave. If you have a degree, you are highly likely to vote to remain. Um, so there's a real tension here between classes, between different social groups. Um, one professor, Anad Menon, who leads a big research project um, connected to the UK um, EU referendum, um, he summed up a visit um, that he made to, I think it was to Sheffield. It was to a very deindustrialized area of Sheffield, and he was talking about globalization. He was talking about the European single market, about how people can move around freely, can get up and go and find jobs anywhere. And as someone put it, who was probably in their 50s, unemployed, that's not my economy. That's not the economy I live in or have ever experienced in my life. I'm completely cut off, cut off from this. But then, this is also a matter of the UK economy in itself. There's large areas of the UK economy that are kind of suffering. A lot of focus is on London. Here we have possibly the next Prime Minister, although some doubt that, Boris Johnson, in front of what's been known, become known as Boris's Brexit battle bus, um, which is the bus he's going around the country touring the UK on. And this gives you an idea about one of the things about solidarity in the UK that this referendum has turned into. We send the EU 350 million a week. Let's fund our NHS instead, vote leave, and then behind them it says, let's take back control. You would be amazed at how many people, if you knock on doors or um, survey people about the EU referendum, identify issues such as the NHS as one of their top concerns. The 350 million figure, is complete and utter nonsense. It has been debunked every day. There are even Eurosceptics who refuse to use that figure. That is the complete contribution the UK would make if Britain didn't have the rebate, if Britain didn't receive any money back in terms of projects. When you take that off, it goes down to about 150 million a week. Um, you know, that's still a lot of money, um, but obviously they like to go around and say 350 million. And then let's fund our NHS. Let's play up people's concern about social services, about community issues, about solidarity within the United Kingdom, over whether or not British people are getting a good deal within the UK from their own government. So this has become an issue about British politics. Um, some say um, Boris is essentially trying to set out a manifesto commitment for what he would do as Prime Minister if after the 23rd of June, David Cameron resigns and Boris wins the leadership of the Conservative Party and becomes Prime Minister. But then the Remain camp also point out that he has made just over 100 billion pounds worth of extra spending commitments in the process of this campaign by saying, we'll spend the money on the NHS, we'll spend it on Northern Ireland, we'll spend it on farmers. We'll, you know, it's, it's like this 350 million is a huge pot of gold to um, help with the austerity measures that the UK has been undergoing over the past few years. This leaves the UK, turning to how the rest of the EU sees it, as very Janus faced. Um, if you've ever dealt with the UK within the European Union, you'll know that the British government, British officials, British diplomats, they're very constructive. The UK has been a very leading player within the European Union more often than we, um, we know. Um, and certainly than the British people know. Um, even in areas that are sensitive, such as foreign and security policy, the UK has often been in the driving seat, sometimes not wanting to go as far as it would, um, some as others would like. But then back home in the UK, you get this incredibly negative, nasty um, political message. So Britain is very two-faced about this. And as one Dutch um, commentator um, described it for a um, report I commissioned, Britain suffers from a narcissistic victimization mentality. Only Britain suffers from the EU. Only Britain can see the way forward. Only Britain can see the opportunities around the world. Only Britain could possibly get out of this and make a great deal of it. You know, we're being dragged back by the rest of the European Union, as if the rest of the EU is not aware of the problems it faces, as if the rest of the EU is not aware of the opportunities the rest of the world op offers in terms of emerging markets. Britain has this very narrow, very insular view of its place in the European Union and how it suffers um, or gains from that. And just quickly, will the referendum therefore settle the question? Answer, no, not a chance. Um, there is easily 
a very big possibility that there will be further referendums within several years, and that includes if Britain votes to leave. And I'll explain why in a moment. So, let's turn now to how the rest of the EU will handle the, um, the issue of a British exit in terms of solidarity. These are the different negotiations that will have to take place if Britain votes to leave. First of all, there will be negotiations in the UK in terms of the political negotiations over the leadership of the government, in terms of who becomes the new Prime Minister, as it's pretty certain David Cameron will resign. There will be internal UK MAP discussions with regard to Scotland most prominently, but also with regard to London and other areas over what role they have in any exit negotiations. And the UK will have to negotiate with non-EU partners over possible implications of its exit from the EU. For the rest of the EU, it's not so simple a deal as simply thinking, OK, there'll be a meeting, the EU will meet with the UK, um, and they will discuss a deal and reach a kind of an exit deal. The EU, remember, is required under Article 50 of the EU's treaties to attempt to um, negotiate an exit and post-withdrawal relationship. So there's a commitment here. You must try and develop a relationship with the departing member. The European Council will meet on the Wednesday after the referendum. Um, imagine for a moment you are seated in that chamber as, let's assume, David Cameron walks in. How do you think he will be received if the vote was to leave? Do you think they will slow hand clap him? Or do you think they will pat him on the back and feel sorrow and compassion for him? Or do they think, or will they start to think, okay, David, or whoever's going to be here, please tell us what you want to do in terms of a deal. So there will be that to and fro. And then David Cameron, or whoever's Prime Minister, will leave the room, and that moves us on to the next one. The remaining EU, in brackets, UK negotiations. Now with Britain out of the room, the other 27 member states and the European Parliament will now have to sit there and go, well, what the hell do we do now? What are we going to offer them? What are we going to do? What deal, in terms of an exit deal, in new in terms of new relationships, is best in terms of UK-EU relations, in terms of EU economics, in terms of EU unity? So the EU will have this, um, this discussion to have. They will have to reach agreement on what to offer the UK. At the same time, the remaining EU members will have to discuss, OK, how do we change now? One of our largest member states has just left. That creates a vacuum in terms of, well, changes to qualified majority voting, in terms of budget, in terms of MEPs. It also possibly shifts the balance of power within the European Union, and so member states will be very mindful of this. Who's going to gain from a British exit? Is the EU going to become more inward-looking? Are certain political agendas going to gain from this? Will Germany gain or will Germany lose from a British exit? Will small members gain or will large members gain from a British exit? Will the center of power in the EU move further eastwards, further southwards? So how will the EU itself change? And that will be a, de a, de a debate that will go on within the EU um, in terms of handling a change balance of power within the EU in terms of solidarity. And I'll come on to why that's important in a moment. And then finally, the rest of the EU will have to negotiate with other parts of the European continent, such as Norway and Switzerland, how a British exit may affect them. If Britain wants to become a member of the European Economic Area, for example, that has implications for Norway. And Norway will have to perhaps not agree to this, but be mindful of what this could mean for it. And then during all this, um, Britain will be a member of the EU. It will, it will continue to exercise all powers, and it could disrupt EU business in order to try and get a good deal. At least that's what Michael Gove, a, a prominent Leave campaigner, has promised. How the EU responds to a British exit comes down to what I call the five I's. The two most important ones are ideas and interests. Will the EU prioritize ideas, its political unity, its own solidarity, its own integration in the face of an actual British exit? Or will it prioritize economic interests, perhaps security interests? The UK runs a huge trade deficit with the rest of the EU. The EU does sell more to the UK than the UK sells to the EU. It was about £61 billion in 2014. That leads some British Eurosceptics to argue that the EU needs the UK more than the UK needs the EU. That is certainly not an opinion shared elsewhere within the European Union. Nevertheless, there would be an economic cost from a British exit unless some deal was actually negotiated that pretty much continued the actual economic relations. But then if you did that and did not require the UK to pay in or to commit to any of the political integration or bear any of the costs, 
you are offering the UK a better deal than any other member of the European Union has. So who's next in the queue to leave and get the same deal? So there will be German car manufacturers, Irish farmers, Dutch multinationals who may have to bear a cost from a British exit in order to protect the idea of European unity and European integration. There will also be institutional limits. The EU cannot impose on the UK ridiculously high tariffs because of WTO rules. Um, again, there's also institutional limits in terms of what it can offer the UK in terms of what already exists in relations with countries like Norway and Switzerland and so forth. There will be international pressures. What pressure will the United States put on the European Union and the UK to come to a good deal? Will Britain's prominent international role in defence, in NATO and so forth mean that the EU will try to find a way forward here in security and defence matters? And how will individuals feel? How will Angela Merkel feel facing elections next year here in Germany? Um, how will Francois, Francois Hollande feel? How will they all feel about this in terms of their own domestic politics and survival? Can Angela Merkel go back to Germany and say, we're going to have to bear a, an economic cost from Britain leaving because of European unity? Is that one that she could sell? We have to frame this, and I'll just end, I'll be finished in about two minutes, I hope, by framing this within the series of other questions that the EU faces. Um, Rem Korteweg, a friend of mine at the Centre of European Reform, summarises the four challenges that the EU faces as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. You have famine in terms of hardship in Greece and southern Europe brought about by the Eurozone crisis. You have death going about his business in the, um, in the Mediterranean, harvesting refugees from the Mediterranean Sea. You have war haunting Ukraine. You have pestilence in the form of Euroscepticism spreading from Britain. And if I could, you might have a fifth horseman of the apocalypse on the horizon, um, which is Donald Trump as the President of the United States. You know, these are huge challenges that face the European Union. Brexit, Britain and people don't appreciate that the British question has not been at the top of the list. Um, when the EU agreed to a renegotiation with the UK back in February, um, this was sold in the UK as the renegotiation, the British renegotiation council or summit, as some in the media described it. Forgetting that actually elsewhere in the European Union, it was not just another council to discuss the crisis in Schengen and the British question. The question that overhangs the EU is how many of these crises can it bear at once? What if multiple crises align? If a British exit aligned with another Greek crisis and a Grexit, and you know, if you speak to some of the economists, the EU and the Eurozone has been kick, have been kicking the can down the road, delaying confronting Greece, partly because of the British referendum. Well, OK, what happens now? If Britain votes to leave, do we also face the Grexit crisis and get it over and done with? And this brings me back to something someone said earlier, the Titanic um, comparison. Um, Whenever someone says, you know, should you jump off the Titanic you know, because it's sinking and so forth, well, let's bear in mind the following issues. One, if the Titanic had struck the iceberg head on, it would have survived. If it had struck it with its bow, it actually would have survived. That's what it was designed to do. That's what its watertight compartments were designed to bear. The mistake was changing course. You know, as they say, the, um, the, you know, the path to hell is paved with good intentions. Um, the, the, the officers on the ship had not been instructed that actually the best way to deal with an iceberg was to hit it head on for the Titanic, so they changed course and that doomed the Titanic. As you know, some people say, well, you should get off the Titanic if it's sinking. Well, if you jump off the Titanic, it's not a good idea. One, you die on impact because of either heart failure, because it's freezing cold, or the impact from jumping off high, or you get sucked down with the Titanic anyway because it's such a ginormous thing. Or you freeze to death because it's cold out there on your own. You can, of course, try and get into a lifeboat and sail away, but you're in a lifeboat in the middle of the Atlantic. It's a very lonely place and you're waiting for another ship to come along. You're on your own, essentially. It's not exactly very safe. And besides, as we all remember about this, going back to what I said earlier about um, in, in the United Kingdom, this is an issue where Really, there's a big social issue, a big class issue that under um, kind of people who don't have very high educational levels, people who are very poor, they don't necessarily see what the EU is doing for them. But let's not forget what the Titanic taught us, which is, guess what? Yeah, the rich, they get on fine. They'll survive. They'll get into the lifeboats and sail away. Um, they can do fine. And one of the issues that has come up in the British campaign is that some Eurosceptics 
admit there will be an economic cost from a British exit. It'll last a few years. They talk about a Nike tick that, yeah, will suffer for the first few years, but then we'll come out, and it's only going to be about 4, 5, maybe 6% of GDP, but then we'll be growing in the long run. Well, that's fine if you're in Westminster or the city or in academia. Um, you've got a lifeboat, you're safe. Um, but that's obviously going to hit some of the most poorest in society. But uh, just like with the Titanic, they don't exactly know what's maybe going on. So going back to this um, in terms of what if multiple crises align, what happens if um, the Titanic is sinking and the EU faces a massive crisis in the form of a crisis in Schengen, a crisis in the Eurozone, and a crisis in terms of Britain leaving. Over the last few years, have we seen European debates about handling the, the Eurozone crisis, or have we seen a German-Greece debate? Will we see a British-European debate? Will the rest of the EU collectively find solidarity amongst themselves to face the United Kingdom in leaving, or will the UK be able to divide and rule and pick off different members in terms of their economic interests and concerns? Will the European Union therefore disintegrate in the face of a British exit? Um, and I'll end on this. Um, no, on its own, a British exit cannot unravel the European Union. Um, the UK is not as central to the European Union um, as Germany or France, for example. But if a British exit caused um, concern about French commitment um, to the European Union, problems elsewhere, as I said, then we could be into, uh, into uncharted territory. There is very little literature on European disintegration. You could count, probably on one hand, the number of articles or books that have ever considered how the EU might actually unravel. Most European um, integration literature imagines the EU will just continue to go forward. And to some extent, you can see that actually happening. Um, as I said, the first word there is integration. As we all know, the EU in the face of a crisis has tended to integrate, not disintegrate. So maybe in the face of a massive iceberg and hitting it head on, the European Union may actually integrate. So perhaps a Brexit may see the European Union suffer a shock to begin with, but then actually find the solidarity to rally round and face it down. Nevertheless, it could also face a disintegration. Um, and one of the key things um, that the literature agrees on is the question of Germany. Douglas Weber, um, who is a New Zealand academic based at um, INSEAD, which is a business school in Singapore and Fontainebleau, um, he wrote a piece about European disintegration in which, as he put it, the EU has never yet seen a crisis made in Germany. And by that, he's never quite clear. But when you ask him, he basically means, you know, Germany's never sat there and gone, actually, we're really not sure about this. We're not sure if the European Union is dragging us down now. We're not, you know, is German solidarity now in question with regard to the European project? There we'd be into uncharted territory in terms of um, the EU's unity if a British exit did somehow cause that. And then the final issue, so I've said final several times here, how do we build trust and solidarity? Um, there will be a desire, even within the United Kingdom, after a British exit, to find a way forward in building relations with European partners. Britain is not going to pick itself up and disappear and go somewhere else, just as Eurosceptics and people in the UK will probably have to come to terms with the fact that the EU will remain the European continent's predominant organization for economics, politics, non-traditional security, and so forth. So a relationship will have to be built. And one question that's overhanging all this is where and in what area can the UK and the EU find some way forward? The only area that I can, that I can think of, um, and it's a traditional British strong point, but it's incredibly sensitive, and it doesn't come as a surprise, Britain will almost certainly have to try and make an effort to work with the rest of the EU in foreign security and defense matters. But Having left the European Union, some Eurosceptics will be incredibly sensitive to getting involved in that, and given that that is the ultimate sign of integration for the European Union, will the EU want to share any solidarity it can build in that area with the UK that's left? Thank you very much.